Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess welcome to uh, WOPC. I, uh, I'm happy to be the uh, opening presentation uh, and talk about 55 minutes on Wi-Fi 6. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. So my name is Wes Purvis. If you don't know me, uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Real Wes Purvis. And uh, so the point of this, this talk is what have we learned so far about Wi-Fi 6? Uh, it's been shipping now, or 11AX, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, has been shipping now for um, you know better part of a year, you know two years, depending on uh, you know who you talk to and uh, how you count it. So uh, here's the agenda, right? So what uh, what is the hype around 11AX? What you know? Uh, where are we in the hype cycle? Um, should you know? Should you start deploying? Should you not start deploying? Um, let, then let's get into how does this stuff actually work uh, today? What is um, the real world implementations of Wi-Fi 6 look like? Um, considerations for deploying Wi-Fi 6, as well as uh, troubleshooting. So uh, over the past decade um, or so, we've had several new generations of Wi-Fi. And uh, it's been about every you know, three years. Um, so if we go back to uh, 2013, that's kind of when we got uh, the first you know, 11AC wave one. Um, three years later, we got 11AC wave two. Uh, three years later, we got AX. Um, now, AX, some, you know, some AP started shipping in 2018, but we didn't really get clients until 2019. Uh, so that's why I, I count 2019 as the year that, um, uh, you know, the year of 11AX. Now it's 2020. So what has changed in that year? Um, uh, is it safe to deploy Wi-Fi 6? Um, so you know, where are we in the hype cycle? So this is kind of you know, any technology hype cycle. And uh, you know, we, we kind of had the you know, really early adopters. I would say that was um, you know, first half 2019 uh, into, into the second half of 2019. Uh, I think that we are kind of in the middle. We're kind of at the hump um, to where um, AX is really, uh, you know, majority deployed. Um, I would say, as, you know, from from my vendor's perspective, almost every AP that we ship or that we sell now um, is is uh, is our Wi-Fi six AP. Um, we're really seeing that you know Wi-Fi six is what customers want. Uh, Predominantly for future proofing, um, you know there are some use cases that drive it, but uh, you know a lot of it is that you know they want the longest life cycle, um, and if you know you're buying an AP that is already uh, you know at this point you know been shipping for four years now, um, you know that's kind of that's kind of what's driving 11AX refresh, um, and it also comes down to what is your risk tolerance. So customers that are risk tolerant are certainly deploying uh, Wi-Fi 6. That's, you know, that's higher ed. Um, in a lot of cases, that's uh, some enterprises. Um, but you know, by and large, um, you know, the, the kind of the quote unquote, the, the holdouts are those that are risk adverse. Those are those, you know, those people that if the AP crashes, the AP has stability issues, that's a big deal, uh, and that can't happen. And so we're kind of in that in-between area where uh, you know, I, I would say you know, Wi-Fi 6 is not fully stable yet, but it's also not fully stable. Um, so I, I think in the very early days of, of 11AX, um, there were, you know, the drivers were really rough. Um, there was, you know, you couple that with uh, the combination of uh, a brand new AP, um, you know, for, for, for every vendor, and that led to a bad experience. Uh, a really bad time, I think. Uh, I think largely we are past that. Um, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions here uh, coming up uh, to see if we actually are past that. So, um, you know, I guess it's the morning time. Uh, can, can everybody stand up that has deployed a Wi Fi 6 network or has Wi Fi 6 running? What is that? Maybe half the room? Um, now raise your hand, keep standing, raise your hand if you had a painful experience deploying Wi-Fi 6. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, and then, what, sorry, one more question. Please keep standing. Uh, how many of you have had to turn off Wi-Fi 6? If you've had to turn off Wi-Fi 6. Okay, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for humoring me. Hopefully that, that got your blood flowing. Uh, uh, this, is, this is the major problem with Wi-Fi 6 right now. 
you, in a lot of cases, uh, our customers are turning it off. And uh, it's for, really, there's, there's you know, one, one reason. It's for client interoperability. Um, and really, the only client interoperability issue that we've seen uh, is with Intel clients. Uh, specifically, older generation Intel clients, uh, uh, you know, the uh, you know, 9260s uh, and earlier generations. And it's really kind of unfortunate. Um, basically, what happens if, if, you do, if, if you're running uh, one of those client, uh, client NICs and there's an older driver on that device, it will not even see uh, a Wi-Fi 6 SSID. So that's, uh, that's a pretty big nuisance. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know the easiest thing to do is sort of to is just to disable Wi-Fi 6. Um, you know, just like it, you know, the AP pretends it's a uh, 802.11ac uh, access point, and the clients continue to operate. Um, this this information you can Google. Um, it's it's on the Intel you know pulled directly from the Intel website. Um, and so, you know, this is a this is a really big, probably the number one consideration when you're deploying Wi-Fi 6 is to make sure that your client devices are able to attach. Because uh, if they can't attach, then you know, what's the point? Um, so how do you mitigate? Um, so like I said, the first one is to uh, disable, just disable Wi-Fi 6. Um, that's a solution. Um, it's certainly the easiest, um, but you're kind of pr prolonging the inevitable, in my opinion. I th at some point, you're going to want to enable these features, right? You bought the access point, after all. Um, you know, if, if Maybe you don't want them, but it, you know, likely you do. Um, so what else can you do? Uh, I, what we've seen our customers do is a couple things. I, I think none of them are really great, but um, you know, one of them is you can enable a special Wi-Fi 6 WLAN. Right? You can have a, um, you know, your, your campus WLAN underscore AX or you know, underscore you know, something like that. Just, just to have, so you know, users can still connect. You can still say, yep, we've gone Wi-Fi 6. Um, you know, for a lot of places, that, that marketing ability is, is something that's important. Um, depending on your vendor implementation, you can have, uh, you know, two, two WLANs with the same name um, and disable, um, you know, Wi-Fi 6 on one of them, uh, you know, have, have one of the SSIDs 2.4, disable, uh, disable Wi-Fi 6. You have the second one, uh, which is 5 gig only and has Wi-Fi 6 enabled. Um, depending, again, depending on the implementation, that could have roaming, uh, roaming implications, but um, some vendors, that also works just fine to have two WLANs with the same uh, SSID name, and that kind of gets around this, this whole problem. Uh, really, the right approach, but the one that's most difficult, is to just rip off the Band-Aid. Um, you know, it's, and, and a lot of times, that's easier said than done. Um, you know, you have to have some way of reconciling, you know, who are my client devices, how are they going to be impacted? And, you know, there's, there's not really an easy way to, to do that. You know, you, you might have a, you know, device management uh, so you can pull driver versions, um, but without that, you know, you're kind of shooting in the dark. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you have a large population of Intel clients, this is unfortunately the reality that you live in, uh, you know, at this point in time until, until you, know, device, you know, the drivers are updated, which, you know, how, how often does that happen <laughs> without being forced? So what's working in Wi-Fi 6, right? There's, there's all these features, right? We have, uh, you know, 1024 QAM, we have uh, spatial reuse, target wait time, multi-user MIMO, OFDMA. What's actually working out there in the real world? You know, what, what has been implemented? Um, so here's what we've seen. Uh, first is uh, that actually 1024 QAM is quite robust. Uh, much more robust than we were expecting. It's, I, I kind of compare it to, um, with 11AC, we had uh, typically a client device when it had you know, a strong signal would often flip back and forth between like MCS7 and MCS8 or MCS9, so flipping between 64 QAM and 256 QAM. What we're seeing with AX clients and an AX AP is that radios have actually evolved, they've improved, and so 1024 QAM is sort of the new 256 QAM. Um, we're seeing instead of instead of the, this, that you know an AX client flipping between 64 and 256 QAM, it's now flipping between 256 and 1024 QAM. And again, this is you know a client with with good signal strength. Um, and here's actually a um, a data rate distribution where uh, we had 
Uh, there's a phone that just rang. Uh, we had, uh, uh, so MCS9, right, that's, that's 256 QAM. Um, about 20% of the packets were, were, uh, were MCS9, and the remaining, uh, you know, 78% or whatever uh, were, were 1024 QAM. Um, so this was actually probably one of the most surprising things that I saw. Um, again, this is a, a, a signal, uh, a client connected with a good stig signal strength. The signal strength was NEG 47, um, you know, running bi-directional traffic. So this is not something you'll see all the time, but you know, strong signal, you're actually able to maintain 20, 1024 QAM, which I think is, um, uh, I was not expecting, I think is something that's pretty cool. Spatial reuse. Um, this is, so what you'll see with spatial reuse and target wait time is things are kind of evolving. <laughs> Um, spatial reuse, uh, specifically, uh, you know, BSS coloring, is sort of implemented. You'll see access points actually broadcast uh, their BSS color, but it doesn't seem like the APs or clients, for that matter, are doing a whole lot with that. Beyond uh, color, uh, color collisions, right, so if there's a color collision, two APs on the same channel with the same color, um, you'll, you'll likely see one AP that changes, the chan uh, changes their color. Um, but beyond that, you know, in terms of uh, you know, having different considerations, uh, you know, if, if I have an overlapping BSS with um, you know, a different color, do I take different considerations? Um, you know, that's, we're not really seeing that yet. Um, we're expecting as, uh, as, as chipset manufacturer drivers uh, improve, and that's something, that's kind, of, that's kind of the trend right now, is the, the, the uh, chipset drivers are improving, um, and so this is something we, we expect to be a more commonplace and we really hope is more commonplace because spatial reuse is a really important feature for enabling uh, uh, you know, denser Wi-Fi deployments. Uh, second, uh, next up is, is target wait time. Target wait time uh, is largely unimplemented. Um, you, you will see it, uh, it has been implemented just so as far as uh, Wi-Fi Alliance certification but as far as client device actually taking advantage of it, um, we have not seen that. Um, again, this is something that we expect uh, will be developed uh, on both the AP side and the client side. Um, you know, it's, it's, the hardware support is there, it's just, uh, it's just you know, the driver is actually supporting it. Um, and without, without TWT, um, uh, if, you're, you know, if standard you know, uh, power save is being used, um, that can actually really destroy the benefits of OFDMA. So TWT is one of those important features uh, for, uh, you know, for uh, Wi-Fi 6 in general. How about multi-user MIMO? So multi-user MIMO is, uh, is becoming more common on client devices, right? If it's an AX client, you know it's gonna support multi-user MIMO. Um, if it's uh, a, recent, a recent client, very likely it, it supports multi-user MIMO. Um, but what we're seeing is 11AX APs are like almost always, just, you know, I can say always preferring OFDMA over multi-user MIMO. Um, in our testing, you know, multi-user MIMO has been practically useless. We, we hardly ever see it. Um, uh, and I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, OFDMA is, is much more robust. Um, you know, multi-user MIMO, you kind of need to have strong signal strength. Um, and, you know, clients with good SNR uh, to see the most benefits. OFDMA, you can have really any sort of SNR. Um, so I'm not sad about this. Um, I, you know, if we, if we look at this chart here, um, we have MU transmissions, right? So half of our, half of our transmissions uh, in the TX column were uh, single user. The other half were, uh, were OFDMA. 0% were multi-user MIMO. In the received direction, we didn't see as much OFDMA, um, but we still saw zero multi-user MIMO. There is a feature that allows for um, a combination of multi-user MIMO and OFDMA, which is, you know, uh, if, you like, if you like your multi-user, uh, you can put multi-user in your OFDMA. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, because we're not seeing multi-user MIMO, again, we're not seeing this combination. Um, so the, the way that this works is you actually, you can do multi-user MIMO within an OFDMA resource unit. Uh, the idea, I think, is highly intriguing. Um, so the, the use case that I see is, um, you know, so with, with multi-user MIMO, you, uh, multi-user MIMO really works best in high SNR scenarios, so when the clients are close to the AP. OFDMA works 
whatever. It'll just do its thing. Uh, and so you could potentially have clients that are close to the AP, good SNR. You, uh, you put those in a, you know, a smaller resource unit and, and give them, um, uh, you know, do multi-user MIMO to those clients. Presumably, they're close to the AP, they have high SNR, they're going to receive good throughput. Then you have clients which are further away, um, you know, lower SNR, and they might benefit from having a wider channel bandwidth. And so you, uh, you allocate wider resource units to them uh, and just do OFDMA to them. And so that's kind of the, the use case that I envision. Um, but again, this isn't something that, you know, we ex we're not, I'm not expecting to see this very often. Um, we have, you know, we practically never see uh, multi-user MIMO, especially when OFDMA is enabled. There are limitations um, to multi-user MIMO in the AX world. The first is, um, you know, eight users can uh, be supported uh, total it, with multi-user MIMO and also per resource unit. That's up from 11AC, which is four. Um, and as well, multi-user MIMO is only possible when the resource unit size is greater than 106 tones. So you're not gonna see a 26 tone, you know, with, you know, four multi-user clients in there, more, or four multi-user MIMO clients. And again, have not actually seen this trigger in the real world. How about OFDMA? Where are we with OFDMA? Um, it works, except for when it doesn't. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, John Kilpatrick can attest to this. Um, you know, it's, I've seen it, it just kind of works. Then you, you don't, you know, you go to a different environment and you don't really see OFDMA, and you're not really sure why. Uh, but, you know, I feel like from the testing that I've done across different vendors, different APs, um, I feel encouraged by OFDMA, um, uh, and so kind of the trend that I see is downlink happens a lot more often than uplink. Um, you know, when you're looking at a PCAP, it's more difficult to understand if downlink is happening, but uh, downlink certainly happens uh, more, more commonly than uplink, um, and this, these stats that I got came, uh, came from, you know, these are AP side counters. Um, so this is the same chart I showed on the, on the previous, uh, on the other slide, so basically it's, uh, in the trend, in TX direction, we had 50% single user in the, uh, uh, and then also 50% for multi-user OFDMA. In the receive side, it was less than that, right? We had, it was predominantly single user, 92% single user, 8% um, multi-user OFDMA. Um, you know, this is obviously very widely based on the um, scenario, based on the client devices, whatever, but I feel this is fairly representative, um, you know, it's, with multi-user MIMO, you know, the spatial diversity, how you, know, how you have the clients positioned can be really important. For OFDMA, I find that is less important. Um, it's just kind of, regardless of the RF scenario, OFDMA is kind of, it's happy to do its, its, its thing. Uh, and we're expecting OFDMA to improve, uh, again, over time, as the, as the driver, you know, chipset drivers are improving as well. Um, and so, you know, the schedulers and the drivers, the amount of users that are supported uh, by the drive, you know, by the chipsets are actually, you know, being developed, right? So the hardware is capable of a certain level, but it doesn't seem like uh, that's really been implemented in software yet. So um, how can you spot OFDMA in the wild? So uplink is really, really easy. Uh, if you have a sniffer, any sniffer will do, um, because these are, you'll see trigger frames, uh, and trigger frames are sent at uh, legacy rates. So if, you're, uh, if you have a sniffer, look for, um, look for trigger frames. Um, there's a couple different types of trigger frames, but um, probably the one that you wanna look at most frequently is the trigger basic. Um, and um, so if you expand that frame, you'll actually see, um, in here you'll see the different uh, users that have been scheduled. Um, and so if you expand those, that user info, you'll see the, um, uh, you'll actually see the AID of that client that matches on the AP side. Um, you'll actually see the number of resource units that have been allocated, um, as well as, uh, sorry, a couple other in, uh, interesting tidbits. Um, if you see an MU bar, which is actually in this capture as well, um, that generally, you can generally presume that there is uh, the presence of downlink OFDMA. So an MU bar is the, uh, uh, AP saying, uh, I want all of you to send your acts uh, up to me in an in a, uh, OFDMA fashion. Um, how about looking for downlink OFDMA? Um, downlink OFDMA requires a little bit more effort and um, 
first, you need an AX capable capture device. Um, you will not see downlink OFDMA uh, without an, an AX sniffer. Um, and then depending on the sniffer, um, you may actually pick up um, like the preamble or, or uh, just the radio tap header uh, that precedes a uh, multi-user OFDMA transmission. Uh, and so that's, a, that's in this screenshot. Um, this is actually just, it just says preamble in, in, uh, in Wireshark. Um, and uh, you can look at the uh, HE uh, SIG B field, which, uh, which will show the actual uh, RU allocations for many different clients. Now, this will only show you the actual scheduling. It won't show you data frames. Um, if you want to capture data frames, that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, John Kilpatrick has a whole deep dive on it. Um, I have a couple slides on it towards the end, though, uh, just to kind of show you what you can do. So um, what does OFDMA look like? This is OFDM, single user, right? You, you get the nice, uh, you know, uh, nearly vertical sides, relatively flat top, uh, and you know, tails off uh, towards the sides. OFDMA looks relatively similar, except there's a guard interval, um, you know, some guard units in the middle. Um, so this is actually two clients, 106 resource units each. Um, and uh, you know, this is the, the spectrogram is, is pretty good for looking at when you have just a couple clients or when you have um, you know, a predominantly AX clients. When you have a mix of clients, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, so for example, um, this is actually the same clients just running the test slightly differently you know, at different times. Uh, and so the AP is allocating resource units differently at different times. And that's something that you're gonna see with AX. It's, you're gonna have, you know, a, you, you could have relatively, in, you know, quote unquote, inconsistent performance because resource units are being allocated, uh, you know, not necessarily the same for every single transmission. Uh, you know, one thing that you find with, with OFDMA, you know, in, in the cellular world is, uh, you know, oh, you know, LTE and Wi-Fi, they both have uh, OFDMA now. It's, uh, you, know, you know, scheduled Mac kind of thing. Um, it, they're very, very similar. But there's one key difference, it, and that key difference is uh, LTE is time-based scheduling, where uh, Wi-Fi 6 is, is packet-based scheduling. Um, and so packet-based scheduling, you get this kind of, um, you know, this allocation differences. Um, where you have, you know, one, the test here was one client is transmitting a whole bunch of data and, a, you know, a bunch of different uh, voice clients. Um, and so it just, it just looks different. Um, so the, the spectrogram is not always the best way uh, to validate, hey, is OFDMA happening? Especially when you have AC clients around. This one I liked um, just because it's, I think it's pretty cool looking. Uh, this is eight uplink users um, on an 80 megahertz channel. You can actually see this on a 20 megahertz channel too, but it's more easy to see uh, on 80 megahertz. Um, and so basically, if you, if you count out, there's actually you know, eight chunks, and that represents uh, one, one user each, and there's the, the guard intervals uh, between the channels. So I think that was just was pretty neat to see. How about uh, the number of concurrent users that OFDMA can support? So this, uh, this slide has two charts that basically show the same thing, just a little bit differently. Uh, uh, so the first, the, you know, the first one is on a 20 megahertz channel, we have 242 uh, tones that we can support, uh, and that means we can support up to nine users in a 20 megahertz channel. In a 40 megahertz channel, we can, there's 484 tones, we can support 18 users. In 80 megahertz, double that again, 996 tones, 37 users, and 160 megahertz, not that you'll ever do it, but you can support uh, two times 996 tones, 74 users. Now how does that, how does that actually break down? There's, all, you know, there's a predefined uh, allocation in terms of resource units that you can do. Um, and the second chart kind of breaks that down for you uh, in an easily to digest uh, manner. So uh, in a 20 megahertz channel, um, you, know, you can basically do a whole bunch of you know, nine, 20, uh, 26 tone uh, resource units, and um, 26 tones is about two megahertz. Uh, you can do um, 
uh, four 52 tones plus a 26. Um, that's the plus one means uh, you know an extra 26 uh, 26 tone or an extra two megahertz uh, client. And so you know there's there's a bit of flexibility, but um, you know you have to fit into one of these predefined uh, sort of uh, resource unit allocations, which may not always be optimal for the amount of traffic. Um, you know if you have you know a bunch of low client um, you know low traffic clients. Um, you know, you may not always be able to allocate 26 tones to them. Um, that's just because there's not enough users to justify that, that kind of, um, you know, if, if you only have four users, um, you know, you're probably only going to see, um, you know, 106 tones or 52 tones depending on your channel width. So what are we actually seeing uh, in the real world? Um, if, depending on the data sheets that you look at, you'll see anywhere from uh, you know, uh, an AP can support 37 users at once, um, some say 16. What we're actually seeing is, in the uplink, we're seeing eight users max uh, that's scheduled at one time. Uh, and this one's pretty easy, you know, pretty easy to verify. You can verify in a PCAP uh, and also uh, usually on an AP CLI as well. How about downlink? Downlink, I think eight. Um, uh, I didn't have a, a, an AX capture device, so I couldn't verify this in a PCAP. Um, but uh, from the APCLI, I only saw eight users. Um, and as well, in like a, um, you know, some of the uplink, you know, like an MU bar kind of thing, we also only see eight. So I think it's, it's eight, um, you know, but this, take this one with a grain of salt. Um, so, you know, where, what's, you know what, what gives, right? Why isn't this 37 users um, you know, that, that some APs say they can support? And the answer is software, right? The hardware supports it, but software, you know, the driver needs to, needs to get there. Um, and that's sort of what we're seeing. You know, I, I, some, you know some vendors say we're gonna have a, a, a wave two or gen two of AX. Um, I don't know if that's the right term because most of the features are already there in hardware. It's just, it's just the software that has to catch up. Um, you know, so I, I don't really like that you know, Gen 1, Gen 2 kind of uh, terminology, but um, you know, we will, I think, see an evolution where um, Wi-Fi 6, OFDMA, spatial reuse, TWT, these become more robust over time as the drivers are improving. So I guess the question is, you know, is this stuff actually useful? Um, so did some testing. Um, here's two scenarios with OFDMA. Um, first one is 21 clients. Uh, and so there's 20 11AX clients that are, um, that are doing a simulated Skype call bidirectional and one AC client that's doing a large data transfer. So what, I, uh, you know, what we saw was with OFDMA disabled, you know, we had a, a, a delay of about 70 milliseconds with OFDMA on, we saw a delay uh, of about 30 milliseconds for those voice clients, right? And this is this is best effort traffic. We're not, you know, there's no QoS involved here. Um, you know, with with QoS, you could potentially see even better results. Um, but you know, the, the other thing is the MOS score improved, and you know, improved from a bad MOS score to you know a a pretty good MOS score uh, of around 4.3. We did a second test with 55 clients. Same kind of concept, 50 of those were 11AX clients. Um, these are Dell laptops with the Intel AX200 in them. Um, and we saw similar kind of latency uh, delay improvements and the you know, MOS score improving as well. So for me, the, the takeaway from this slide is, going back to like 11A, we haven't really seen an increase in the number of simultaneous voice users that we can support on Wi-Fi on, on one single AP. And that's because voice traffic is non-aggregated, um, small packets, uh, really kind of, you know, the, the additions that have been added to WIFO over the years, aggregation, um, you know, higher data rates. Voice doesn't really take too much advantage of. But now with o OFDMA, we can allocate smaller resource units, um, you know, particularly when there's a lot of voice clients, and potentially support more voice clients, which I think is something that's pretty cool. Um, you know, this testing suggests that it's possible um, this is with simulated clients, you know, simulated voice calls, real clients. But, uh, you know, this is something that, um, you know, we're definitely encouraged by seeing. So after all this, you know, is it, um, you know, is it actually worth deploying AX? 
I don't know, I leave that to you. Um, I, th I think that these results are encouraging. Um, I think that there's still uh, a ways to go. I think hopefully we are past uh, you know, a lot of the major stability issues, the chipsets from a stability perspective have certainly, uh, have certainly matured. Um, you know, we, from, you know, from our perspective, like I said, most of our customers are now deploying AX um, successfully. Um, it's hit or miss whether AX, you know, Wi-Fi 6 is actually turned on uh, based on if they have Intel clients. But, um, you know, this is just kind of what we're seeing, you know, out there in the wild with, uh, with Wi-Fi 6. How about data rates? Um, you know, just, you know, kind of things to hit on with, I think the data rate is something that's less important now because there's so many of them. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to keep track of them. You know, with 11N, three spatial streams is pretty simple. You know, you 40 megahertz channel, your data rate was 450 megabits a second. Um, and if you saw 450, you knew things were great. But with AX, you know, that same 450, you could get to in a lot of different combinations of spatial streams, resource units, um, uh, you know, channel bandwidth. And so it's not as like that, I think that data rate concept is a lot less important. Um, I think it's more important to look at the, you know, the individual contributors that, that make up that data rate. Um, and, uh, you know, for your reference, Francois has a, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, a list of the MCS rates. Uh, and I actually pulled this, this uh, formula from his website as well. Um, and uh, so go check that out. Uh, I use that reference all the time just to, oh, yep, here's the data rate that this actually means. So how about considerations for deploying Wi-Fi 6? Do you, need to de do you need to treat your Wi-Fi 6 deployment any different than you would your, you know, your current generations of deployments? So a short answer is today when you're deploying, no, most likely you do not need to consider anything different because you still have a plethora of 11AC, 11N clients out there that, uh, that you need to support. Um, so when, you are, when you're actually deploying, you can really follow the same design rules that you would for 11AC. Um, so because 11AC clients are still the majority and they likely will be uh, for the foreseeable future, um, you know, there's just a Cisco Live event, I think the number was what 10% of AX clients um, maybe, even, yeah, maybe even less than that. Um, so, you know, we kind of saw the same ramp up with 11AC. It just takes a couple of years for client devices to become cl uh, commonplace. Um, uh, and, you know, once they will be, you know, maybe there's slightly different considerations, but I don't even think they're that different. Um, I think that, you know, the big, you know, the big shift is, you know, your consideration is, am I deploying for coverage? Am I deploying for ca uh, or capacity? Right, so you still need to take into consideration what is the capability of my client device, what is the, you know, the applications that are gonna be used, what is the number of clients that are in use um, when you come up with your design. And so just, I like this slide because it's you know, a little flow chart of, you know, if you're migrating from a previous generation, you know, what do you need to do? Um, and the first thing you need to decide is, do I have a coverage network? Do I have a capacity network? If I have a coverage network, do I need a capacity network? Um, Likely the answer is yes. Uh, that's what we see with almost every customer. But again, you know, there are use cases uh, and, and customers who do not need capacity. But, um, you know, so basically, you know, decide what you need. Um, if you have a capacity-based design already, decide whether or not do I have users complaining or do I not. If I don't have users complaining, do I expect that the network will grow? If I expect the network to grow or I have more devices come on, do a redesign. If I'm, not, if I'm not having users complaining, or if I am having users complaining, I wanna do a redesign. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, design is something that's super important. Um, that doesn't change with, with AX. You still need to design. Um, and uh, you know, if, you, if you do a good design, you can come out with a uh, well-performing network, whether it's AC, whether it's AX, um, it is possible. Now how about for tomorrow, right? When we have a predominant mix, a large mix of, of AX clients. So Wi-Fi 6 is not, is not built for, you know, it's, it's not about the maximum instantaneous throughput. It's about improving Wi-Fi in dense environments. So if you have that in your mind when you're deploying, um, then you can adjust, you know, what you do, you know, slightly differently. So assuming we have mostly or all Wi-Fi 6 clients, Let's remember, Wi-Fi 6 is about OFDMA. Uh, in my opinion, MU-MIMO is useless. Um, 
And so Wi-Fi 6 is about OFDMA. And uh, so when we have that in mind, uh, the other piece is spatial reuse. So we can support, uh, you know, especially in dense environments. But there's nothing in Wi-Fi 6 about roaming. So there's, you still have to think about your uh, AP placements. You know, you can't place APs too close together or else your clients aren't gonna roam. Um, so roaming is something that's, that's super important. Um, so really, you use the same design principles um, as you would for AC or a capacity-based design. Uh, just expect to be able to support you know, probably a higher client density. It's, it's really as simple as that. Uh, what, you know, what that higher client device density is, I think that remains to be seen. Um, you know, some of the some of the testing that we've done, you know, is encouraging, but you know, that's that's in the lab. Um, you know, it's not real. It's not you know in the real world when you have you know external interference sources. Um, so some of that stuff I think is still to be determined. But we are expecting that there will be um, you know ability to support higher higher densities, especially if the clients are real time or time sensitive or latency sensitive applications, or if they're chatty applications or they're using you know, uh, uh, small packets, right? Small packets is really, or smaller packets, I should say, uh, where there's ma more transmission opportunities um, is something that, um, uh, you know, is something that OFDMA helps more than say a large packet where there's a lot of aggregation and you're not transmitting as much. I think um, one of the other things about Wi-Fi 6 and OFDMA is um, the concept of the AP owning the channel a little bit more. And so when you have um, when you have an entirely mix, you know, enti entire uh, cell of Wi-Fi six clients, the AP can actually own that cell. Um, when there are legacy clients in, you know, they look at standard just EDCA. But when there is when there are um, when it's when it's all OFDMA clients, the there's actually a second set of EDCA parameters, right? Just for just for uh, OFDMA clients and multi-user clients, um, and essentially they have long long backoffs. And so clients are less likely to actually contend for the channel, and the AP has that ability to say, uh, I'm gonna get on the channel, and this is what I'm gonna do. You know, you three clients, you five clients, you transmit, um, or I'm about to transmit to you. Now how about chipset vendors? How does this come into play? Uh, so really there's two, uh, there's two major chipset vendors out there in the Wi-Fi space today. That's Qualcomm, and that's Broadcom. Uh, full, full disclosure, my vendor uh, has a Broadcom AP. Uh, so I may have in, inherent biases, but uh, just to put that out there. Uh, so Broadcom APs, right? These are, um, uh, y these are you know, your um, you know, extreme APs. Uh, uh, the first Aruba AP, the 515, was actually Broadcom. Um, the Cisco 91, 15, and 20 are Broadcom. Uh, missed AP 43. Uh, and these APs are fully Wi-Fi 6 uh, certifiable. On the Qualcomm side of the house, there's really two flavors of Qualcomm APs. There's what we call Gen 1 and Gen 2. Uh, the Gen 1, uh, if I can make one ask of this is, please don't deploy those. I mean, why would you buy this AP uh, if, you know, there, so this AP does not, these, uh, this chipset does not support uplink OFDMA. Um, and, you know, you're really kind of limiting yourself if you're trying to actually deploy AX for, you know, for its benefits. Um, and so luckily these APs mostly have, they've actually all been replaced. There's already a second generation for all those APs. Um, and so this Qualcomm, you know, Gen 2, uh, these are like the Aruba 535, 555s. You know, Aruba actually skipped uh, the Gen 1 Qualcomm APs entirely. Um, Cisco 9130, the Meraki APs that were just announced recently, the um, 46 and 56, and the Ruckus uh, R750. And these APs are these APs are fully Wi-Fi 6 certifiable. You know, they support all the necessary features. They support all the features that I've been talking about through this entire presentation. Again, the software quality, uh, or sorry, driver capabilities, um, you know, varies. Uh, and, you know, these are what's gonna be improving. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to kind of, what, uh, you know, what are you buying, right? And so, how do you know if you have a Qualcomm or Broadcom AP? Um, you know, other than this list, a lot of times you can just take a PCAP, you can look in the beacon, uh, and you'll usually see a vendor-specific attribute, um, for, you know, if it's a Broadcom or Qualcomm AP. Not always, um, depending on the vendor that's deploying, you know, that sells this AP, but usually you'll see something like this. Now, how about 4x4 versus 8x8? Um, I think that this is a, um, with, with like 11AC, with 11N, 
um, mostly 11AC, like the APs were kind of similar, right? You, you know, you had all four by four APs, that was your flagship, uh, you know, they all kind of supported this, the features. But now in AX, we kind of have a, a fork in the road, right? Qualcomm has gone the eight by eight route, Broadcom has gone the four by four route. So does it matter four by four versus eight by eight? Um, so what we, you know, what we see is customers kind of, they see that eight, right? And eight is higher or greater than four. So eight must be better. And I don't, you know, is that true? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, there's a couple considerations, right? So um, uh, th really there's, I think, three general benefits to an eight by eight AP. The first is, um, for you know, transmit beam forming and uh, MRC, you know, these types of uh, scenarios where it's, it's beneficial to have degrees of freedom or you know, extra transmitters or receivers so that you can shape or combine signals uh, and transmit or receive. So that's eight by eight, but four by four is already pretty good, right? You're four by four, most clients are two by two, um, so four by four, there's already a set of you know, degree, but you know, I can give this one to eight by eight. Uh, there is actually an advantage here. Eight by eight is useful one, when there are eight by eight clients. Uh, oh yeah, I don't think there are any eight by eight clients yet. <laughs> uh, so uh, now for, you know, for, you know, other use cases could be like a point to point bridge kind of thing, um, indoor or outdoor mesh. The, the problem is eight spatial streams, even four spatial streams outdoors is extremely difficult to support um, because there's, there's not enough multipath. And so, uh, you know, I think for longer range point, point to point bridges, um, you know, eight by eight is not also, you know, is not actually that useful um, because of the lack of multipath. And then the last thing is multi-user MIMO. So multi-user MIMO, as I explained, uh, I think is already, is, is useless. Um, you know, with, with, the, with the advent of OFDMA, you know, whether it's a Qualcomm or Broadcom AP across vendors, we're not seeing uh, we're not seeing downlink or uplink uh, uh, multi-user MIMO. It's just not happening. They're doing OFDMA instead. There is a, another interesting dynamic here, which is the concept of a dual five four by four versus eight by eight. Um, so the second gen Qualcomm chip is actually capable of splitting into two. Um, uh, and so, you know, you know, how does that compare to, you know, most of the Broadcom APs also support dual, you know, dual four by four. Um, you do pick up an extra 2.4 radio, um, uh, but just a, kind of an interesting to think about. I don't think it's been fully fleshed out yet. Um, support from vendors is, is either there or you know, is coming, um, and the, the usefulness of that split radio still remains to be seen, um, but it is, you know, it is something to know that exists. Now how about multi-gigabit? So this is uh, one of our K through 12 uh, customers. And this is a high school. There are 190 access points, 5,000 clients, 5,200 clients connected here. And the throughput is 1.5, uh, yeah, right there. That, that's the throughput, 1.5 gigabit per second across those 190 APs. So multi-gigabit, I ask again, do you need it? Uh, you know, you be, you be the judge. You know, there are scenarios when you could use it, um, but for your typical deployment, almost all deployments, um, you know, you're still gonna struggle to really, you know, exceed a gigabit in aggregate across all of your APs. So do you need to upgrade your switches? Do you need to be able to support multi-gig? Um, I think there's, there's predominantly three reasons to upgrade a switch. Uh, the first is if the switch has gone end of life. Uh, that's a pretty good reason to upgrade. Second is PoE. Um, depending on the AP that you buy, you're at least gonna probably need AT power. You might even need BT if you go the uh, 8 by 8 route. Not always, but sometimes. Um, and then the third reason is multi-gigabit. So there's other, you know, you could use multi-gigabit not just for Wi-Fi, there's other use cases for it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, the major use case that's being pushed, especially by vendors, is, is for Wi-Fi upgrades. And I leave that one up to you. <laughs> Um, so will you actually exceed more than a gig of throughput? Uh, I think likely not. Um, you know, if you're deploying 160 meg channels, maybe. If you're deploying 80 meg channels, maybe. Um, but, so if you get, most of, the, most of the AX APs at least have a two and a half gig file on them. 
Um, some even have the five gig. I think the five gig, you're not even gonna get close to. Two and a half, you're probably not even gonna get close to either. Um, a gig, I, th I don't think you're gonna exceed. Um, here's just some kind of quick back of, back of napkin type math. So in a 20 megahertz channel, uh, you will not exceed a gig. Not even with uh, uh, you know, uh, eight spatial streams or dual five, uh, four spatial streams. It's just not gonna happen. 40 megahertz channel, it's possible. Um, if you have an eight spatial stream device at M7 or M8, you could exceed a gig. Um, if you have uh, four spatial stream, dual five, you're not gonna exceed a gig. Uh, it, and this is real world, right? When I'm, not, I'm not talking about you have the client three feet away from the AP and uh, you know, really best case. Uh, 80 megahertz channels, you can exceed with three spatial streams, uh, you know, 1024 qualm, you're gonna exceed a gig. So it is possible. I think the scenarios are not likely. Um, um, so, you know, but it is something to keep in mind when you are actually upgrading and, uh, you know, thinking about your entire refresh. How about clients? So uh, we've actually had a pretty good uptick in clients in the past, uh, in the past six or eight months. Um, so the first, you know, kind of, uh, two, you know, the two clients that really paved the way were the Intel AX200. Um, that's an M.2 form factor you can put into most laptops. Um, a lot of laptops actually include it now. And the second was uh, Samsung, right, with the uh, S10, S10e, whatever you want to call them. Now there's the S20, which also supports Wi-Fi 6. Um, towards the end of last year, the iPhone came out, iPhone 11, that supports Wi-Fi 6. Now some of these, uh, like iPhone is a, a so-so uh, Wi-Fi 6 client, I think. Um, it's not it doesn't seem to participate in OFDMA uh, as frequently as say the Intel or the Samsungs. Um, and then you know, there's, there's a plethora of other uh, devices on here. You, know, you can buy laptops now with, uh, with AX in them, but other devices that are not on, the, on this list, um, there is a, a, uh, on the Wi-Fi Alliance website, there's a list of certified clients and chipsets. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think client devices are, are on the up and up. Um, you know, I, I would like to see more devices, but I think the fact that you know, the iPhone and, and you know, the major, you know, the flagship uh, Android, uh, Samsung uh, S20 and S10 support Wi-Fi 6, I think that's a major step forward. Um, you know, the, next, the next step is sort of uh, Mac, you know, Mac laptops and uh, iPads and, and some, of the, some of the other tablets. Um, but you know, hopefully we get there um, you know, within, you know, this year we'll start to see more clients. So how do you troubleshoot in the Wi-Fi 6 world? It's a little more complicated now, or it can be, or maybe not, you decide. So uh, I think most, most troubleshooting, you actually do not uh, need to adjust how you, how, you know, adjust your tools. You can actually troubleshoot you know, the majority with your current uh, tool set, right? If you're, the majority of Wi-Fi problems are connectivity problems and roaming problems. And that doesn't change, right? You can, those are still legacy frames. You can use a, um, you know, your MacBook sniffer, any other sniffer that you have. Um, you don't actually need to be able to sniff AX traffic to be able to debug those. Um, most of the tools out there, Wireshark, uh, you know, Ekahau Pro, Wi-Fi Explorer, they are, even though you have an AC device, they actually do decode those as AX. Um, so from a tools perspective, um, and for most troubleshooting, you do not actually need to upgrade uh, your tools. But um, how about if you actually wanna capture data traffic? So that's where it gets a little more complicated and um, if you find yourself capturing a lot of data traffic, you may wanna upgrade um, your capture devices. So it's the same procedure. You know, this is, uh, let's, the first example I wanna give is capturing single user traffic. Um, so it's the same procedure as you're used to in your previous generations, except the only difference is that your, uh, your capture device supports 11AX. So what devices support 11AX for capturing? Uh, some Wi-Fi 6 APs will let you turn into a sniffer mode um, so you can capture Wi-Fi 6 traffic, um, or the Intel AX200 is one uh, that you can turn into monitor mode um, you know, on, in Linux um, to be able to capture. There are a number of blogs out there uh, instructions on how to do it, um, uh, and seems to work pretty well. So uh, you also need a recent version of Wireshark to be able to properly decode uh, AX traffic. So the current version is uh, 321, and um, that actually has pretty good support for uh, decoding AX traffic, single user and multi-user. 
How about if you want to capture multi-user traffic? This is where it gets even more complicated. Um, there is not a great way to, uh, to capture multi-user traffic. It is possible. Um, it's extremely clunky, in my opinion. Uh, you, can you can only capture one multi-user client at a time, but you can capture it, which is cool. Uh, and so um, the way that you capture this is um, in, the, in the uplink, you, um, you basically you put in the AID and the BSSID into, uh, this is on the Intel uh, AX200, you put in the uh, AID and the MAC address uh, into a, you write it to a file and it puts a filter on the capture and you start the capture and magically you'll see uh, up, uh, uplink frames. And so in the uplink direction, um, the, the data frames will actually show up as HE trigger frames, which uh, you can see in here somewhere. Uh, where'd it go? Yeah, right there, HE trigger. Um, downlink frames will actually show as HEMU. Um, so that's kind of how you know the difference besides looking at the uh, source and destination. Um, there are a number of, uh, actually there are not as many uh, resources on capturing multi-user traffic, um, but uh, uh, they do exist. I can never say his name, it's Germond? Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, he has some, uh, a lot of really great resources on OFDMA and, and capturing OFDMA. Definitely go check out his website. Um, for, for instructions if you're interested in going down this path. I pulled this uh, screenshot from his website. <laughs> um, and so how about, um, oh, I actually had a call out, didn't realize. So that's the HE trigger. Um, so that's you know, mostly, that's, that's Wi-Fi 6 in a nutshell. Um, we have another uh, related technology called Wi-Fi 6E. Um, and I think this is, you know, has come up a couple times, so I just want to spend uh, my last three minutes talking about Wi-Fi 6E, because uh, if you know, if you look last week, Broadcom made an announcement. Um, so Wi-Fi 6E is now. We have uh, client devices. That's a good first step, I guess. But if you look at it a little bit closer, you see the regulatory bodies have not actually approved uh, these channels for Wi-Fi use. Um, in the U.S., the FCC wants to quote unquote move quickly. But what does that mean? You know, hopefully, you know, hopefully that's this year. Um, but uh, you know, there's no firm timelines on that, and nothing's been approved. The uh, the cable industry, I think, is actually fighting this. Um, with uh, you know, this this the predominant incumbent is um, is like ENG, uh, uh, you know, television uh, equipment, and um, so that's that's still being worked out, and definitely something that's still being lobbied. Um, so I got some so some slides from uh, from UC. Thank you for these. Um, so in the U.S., we have about 1.2 gigahertz of, of spectrum uh, potentially opening up, um, and there's really again there's no timelines here, but we uh, we are expecting s some decision um, you know this year, um, and obviously nothing can happen with Wi-Fi 6E in the U.S. until this is approved. Um, in the uh, in the EU, um, there's a little bit less spectrum, but um, uh, it. The decision is expected to be made again sometime this year, later this year, uh, November timeframe possibly. And uh, now with Brexit, the UK, it's uh, expected to be a kind of similar story as EU. So that's it. Um, thank you. I will take any questions. No, just kidding. <laughs>